Andreas is an art historian and curator who lives in Berlin, currently visiting professor of, for art history and media theory at the Academy of Fine Arts, Leipzig. He was the founding director of the Dortmunder U Center for Art and Creativity and has curated exhibitions and festivals in major European venues, including Transmediale and ISEA 2010. He was the author of Machine Art in the 20th Century, MIT Press 2016. In university courses, curatorial projects and lectures, he deals with art, technology, digital culture, and aesthetics of the machine. So with this, I'm giving the word to Andreas. Thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, I will switch this on. Hello. Um, I hope everything's going to work. And uh, as in all of these other situations that we've been in over the last six or seven months, this is, of course, also an experiment. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of it, and I look forward to all our failures and successes. Um, and please somehow give me a sign if uh, something's not right. Um, again, I would like to thank Boyana Romic and Bo Reimer for the kind invitation to participate in the conference, which from what I've seen in the videos is going to be really interesting. And it, I hope for interesting exchanges with everybody. And of course, also to Richard Topgard for the excellent and very smooth preparations over the last days. Um, in my talk today, I want to elaborate on two aspects of the debate which brings us together in this conference. One is the contribution that artworks can make to our reflection on cultural meanings of technology. And the other is the mythology of technology that infuses our conversations through the terms and metaphors we use. I speak here as an art historian who is convinced that we can learn to ask our questions differently, the big ones and the small ones, by investigating artworks. That's why thinking about art, AI and artificial creativity, I propose to look, for instance, at the work of the Canadian artist David Rokeby, who in his various works of the past 30 years has explored the logics and the aesthetics of such supposedly intelligent systems. Rokeby's work, Sorting Demon, confronts us with a system that discriminates on the basis of color. And the installation taken is based on a surveillance system that randomly attributes qualities to specific people in the exhibition space. And the interactive installation Enchant, which some of you may have seen in the video that we posted on the website, stages an encounter of the visitors with a flock of networked yet partly independent computer entities whose chorus can be interrupted by speaking and contributing to their knowledge base. It is a work about an alien encounter about the problems of dialogue and about feedback and understanding between humans and computational systems. I introduce it here as an example of the type of complexity that we should be able to expect from artworks through which we venture into the discussion on artificial creativity. In comparison, much of what we see in the field of so-called AI art is rather facile and superficial and, and thus much less helpful in probing our understanding of these systems and of our technological condition in general. In order to also open up my second language critical train of thought, I want to briefly explain my use of the word we a tiny and malicious inclusively, uh, maliciously inclusive word. The we is a rhetorical form of strategic inclusion that more often than not seeks to obscure differences. 
a most problematic assumption that comes with the we is the insinuation of a homogeneous group, sometimes even the whole of mankind. Importantly, the we regularly gives an illusion and a totally false sense of shared ideas, aims, and values. It is Patricia Reed who suggested that one should only use the word we for a type of solidarity that is coupled with a clear sense of difference. A we that does not seek to homogenize and paste over differences, but one that actively presupposes them, as in, I recognize your difference, let's be in this together. It is a use of the we that is conscious of conflicting interests and aware of the intrusiveness of its own claims. It is in this sense that I say we, addressing those who are listening, aware that you have other thoughts on what I might be saying. The same type of bracketing of putting between quotation marks is something that we should do with all the contested words that we use here in the coming days. And with some of the uncontested words too, I guess. Such bracketing is not only a way to estrange us from those words, it is also a way to make us skeptical about the rhetorical purpose of certain expressions. The irritations that many people feel even at the thought of an, quotation, artificial creativity, this irritation is an indication how timely such skepticism can be. The discipline of art history may offer some consolation, since it can remind us that the delegation of creativity is not new and not germane to media and computer art, and that it has a tradition that takes us back more than a century from Dada and surrealism to pop art and new realism. When we think of the status of Duchamp's ready-mades and rotor reliefs, or Warhol's factory, or the different strands of generative art, we realize that questions about the artistic validity of technical products and reproductions have formed part of the bedrock of art theoretical reflections for decades. Their subversion of notions like artistic intention and artistic genius is not collateral damage, but it is constitutive of art discourses throughout the 20th century. Some of these questions are even at least as old as the discourses on photography and on modern printing techniques, discourses that date back to the 19th century. I believe that one of the reasons why the questions of, question of artificial creativity is so present is that from abstract expressionism through pop art to institutional critique, such discussions about the delegation of the creative act have been a pivot for debates on human production and creativity in the age of mass industrial production and consumption. Questioning the status of the artist is an inherent part of these considerations ever since the nonsense performance of Dada, the psychic automatism of surrealism, and the mathematical automatism of concrete art. Of course, it is interesting to speculate about the art status of objects or practices which are produced or performed by non-human agents. But as in the cases of Duchamp's ready-mades and Warhol's Brillo boxes or Sturtevant's repositions, it is unlikely that machine artworks will ever or end this or destroy art. Rather, they may contribute to a 
to the continuous transformation of sense making that we tend to categorize as art, as witnessed in the debates around the works and practices by artists like Jeff Koons, Sherry Levine, or Richard Prince, which have deliberately put the artist between quotation marks. It may well be that machine learning and a technique like generative adversarial networks may offer new conceptual challenges to these debates. But from an art theoretical perspective, these challenges form part of a set of such reconfigurations of artistic practice throughout the last hundred years. The automatisms of abstract surrealist paintings by mid 20th century artists like Wolz, Emily Bridgewater or Richard Oelze are the results of automatic drawing and writing exercises by someone like Henri Michaud were psychic rather than technical. But, these, but the confrontation with their visual output emerging from the uncanny depth of the unconscious was, we can presume, no less shocking than more recently the discovery of supposed visual desires of AI systems. A most striking reference example for some of the new GAN-related artworks are the paintings and drawings by the Czech artists Gjindrich Stirsky and Toyen, the artist name for Marie Czerminova. Artworks which combine abstract painterly surfaces with the placement of at times distorted, at other times clearly recognizable, partial objects, body parts, everyday objects. During a joint stay in Paris in 1924-28, Stierski and Toyen had developed the principle or style of artificialism, conceptually framing the abstracted surrealism of their artistic production of the following years. In their manifesto of artificialism, they wrote, an artificial painting is not bound to reality in time, place and space. And for that reason, it does not provide associative ideas. Reality and forms of the painting repulse each other. The greater the distance between them, the more visually dramatic is the emotiveness, giving birth to analogies of emotions their connected rippling echoes all the more distant and complex, so that at the moment of confrontation between reality and image, both feel entirely alien in relation to each other. We can glean from passages like this that there are complex conceptual and aesthetic decisions that lead to the realization of such artworks and that masking this conceptual and aesthetic framing can be a part of an artistic strategy. To the same extent that it is the task of the art historian to uncover such maskings and the historical lineages, it is the task of the contemporary critics of a technologically infused culture to pinpoint the technical affordances of specific systems and to counter technological mystifications. In her book on AI art, Joanna Zielinska, who will speak here tomorrow, insists that, I quote, humans are quintessentially technical beings in the sense that we have emerged with technology and throughout and through our relationship to it. She suggests that we should see different forms of human activity as having always relied on technical prostheses and forming part of technical assemblages. 
This includes, end of quote, this includes human active, human creative acts, which have in the tradition of so-called Western philosophy since Greek antiquity been conceived in conjunction with and made possible through techniques. The results of human invention, ingenuity, call it creativity if you like, these results are always artificial. That is, they are artifice made in addition to the naturally given. I shared on a Haraway's conviction that it is necessary to come up with new terms and narratives that are able to capture these assemblages and the techno-scientific entanglements of human bodies and minds. It's a conviction that made Haraway come up with the notion of the Stuttgart and with her manifesto for cyborgs. Over the next two days, several terms will be similarly bracketed, historicized and demystified, including creativity, the artificial and the human. In the second part of my talk, and as my contribution to this exercise of estrangement and demystification, I want to speak about the notion of the machine and that of the robot. I believe it is necessary to distinguish rigorously the terms machine and robot, both with regard to a more general understanding of techniques and with regard to technology as its paradigmatic framework. Moreover, from my analysis of their usage in the 20th century, both machine and robot are terms that manifest and uphold an antagonistic conception of the relationship between human and techniques, which, as Joanna Zielinska aptly suggests, we may want to overcome. What I'll try to convey here is that the machine is not a technical system or an apparatus, but that the modern notion of the machine, roughly speaking that of the 19th and 20th centuries, describes a particular type of relationship that humans have with such technical systems. And I know this is a little bit uh, counterintuitive to the normal use of the term, but that's what makes it so interesting and important to look at it from this skirted angle. It is a relationship characterized by antagonism. The machine is always considered as an adversarial other, potentially threatening and as something to worry about. At the same time, the use of the word machine also marks the conviction that the speaker is a human and not a technical being. The word machine marks the claim to an ontological difference which affirms the humanness of the speaker and it disregards the possibility of a post-human entanglement with one's technological environment. On the level of human communication and culture, the machine operates as a myth. Myth not understood in the polemical sense of an untrue story, but rather in the functional sense of the term. Very generally speaking, a myth is a form of narrative that is ingrained in the culture. A myth is collectively held. It has a narrative kernel, which is both variable and of extended continuity. It gets repeated and affirmed, and it is powerful. Think, for instance, of the myth of Oedipus. Whenever the name Oedipus or Oedipus is mentioned, the whole complex narrative of the myth, its proponents and tragic twists, is evoked. It is, I believe, possible to identify the narrative kernel of the myth of the machine. 
whenever the term machine is used, the whole of the associative baggage of the myth of the machine is brought into play. It goes something like this. This is the myth of the machine. There is a man-made object. It can be a physical device or a symbolical representation related to techniques by association or indexicality. It is composed of technical elements, it has moving parts, and it has a function which it performs by repetitive movement. And it exhibits a certain form of beauty. It is made to function automatically and independent of direct and continuous human intervention. Over time, the object attains an increasing degree of autonomy. It may provide interfaces for human interaction. These, however, do not determine the functionality. The human interaction can be replaced by technical elements or by other machines. The interfaces offer the human an illusion of control which can be overridden by the machine. The interfaces are only there to appease the humans for their play and enjoyment or for human machine conviviality. The autonomy of the machine becomes threatening for humans who fearfully struggle not for their lives, but for self-determination. The threat posed by the machine is existential, but not lethal. The narrative tends not to have an ending. If it has one, then the story ends well for the humans. Like other myths, the myth of the machine can be varied but it cannot be told completely differently. It is always this one story of something man-made being functional and then gaining a dangerous, non-lethal form of autonomy. Consider the example of a loom. It is a technical device that is used for weaving textiles. But when a person beholds the loom, and says, ah, a machine. He or she calls up the myth of the machine and at once the machine's particular narrative framing comes into play, its blueprint, its construction, its degrees of freedom and the inherent threat. The ways in which the loom is then treated in the realm of the myth is different from how it is treated when viewed as a weaving device. We can, what we can learn from this mythological understanding of the machine is that the modern human conception of self is imbricated with technology in this particular way. There really is no machine outside this narrative. And whenever the word machine is uttered, this figure of speech constructs the relationship between human and the technical object within that mythical structure as binary, antagonistic, and ontologically differentiated. It can be tiring, I can tell you, to have to watch your words like that. But I firmly believe that some of our worries and problems come from an unconscious use of language. I therefore try not to use technical terms in a metaphorical way and avoid calling something algorithmic, for instance, that is not like the DNA or human behavior. An algorithm is a set of defined rules for conducting iterative mathematical operations and only such a mathematical rule set can meaningfully 
be described as an algorithm. Of course, it is possible to use the term figuratively or metaphorically, but then you enter into the realm of associations and cultural meanings. An only superficially technical term like machine is rarely defined precisely and more often used in such a general and metaphorical way, submerging the discourse in a mythological soup. What I'm proposing here instead is to speak about the myth of the machine and not in or through this myth. To this end, it is useful to, to clearly distinguish between robots and machines, terms that are too often used interchangeably and synonymously. Machine and robot differ significantly, firstly, with respect to the concept of work, a crucial part of the modern self-definition of man, and secondly, regarding their relationship to anthropomorphism, that is to the way in which non-human objects are assimilated to the human form or to human modes of perception. As a mere illustration, I show you a documentation photo from the 1985 exhibition Les Immatériaux, where in a site called Auto-Engendrement, an industrial robot from automobile production carved a shape of a car front out of a polystyrene block. The robot works like a human performing tasks, which at least theoretically a human worker could also carry out. The robot might work faster or more untiringly or it can perform movements or operations that humans are anatomically incapable of. The robot is a servant, a colleague, and hence also a rival who can replace humans as workers. The machine, by contrast, can perform operations which a human being precisely cannot typically the generation and transmission of power in manufacturing processes or the execution of calculations, the complexity and speed of which exceed human capacities. In industrial manufacturing, the machine allows for new, new work procedures while the robot directly replaces the human being. In this sense, the figurative automatons of the 18th century belong to the genealogy of the robot. The scribes, dancers and chess players visualize the substitution of the human and his or her activities by technical characters. Contrary to this, the machine is what the human is not and the machine principally performs what the human cannot. Chico McMurtry's tumbling man, who unsuccessfully attempts to stand upright on his legs, displays the classical characteristics of a robot. It is anthropomorphically shaped according to the human body and its labors convey a seemingly tragic inability to master the ultimate bit of bodily control which would enable the upright bipedal walk. The aesthetic appeal of McMurtry's robot lies in its mimetic behavior which impels the viewer to feel sympathy for this obviously inanimate technical entity. Robots follow an aesthetic of similarity and of behavior, while machines serve an aesthetic of function and processing. 
both terms, robot and machine, are seemingly used in a purely technical sense, but there is always a resonating cultural content. Hence, it is important not to regard the anthropomorphization of techniques as naturally given, but as a myth, as a narrative humans tell to themselves in order to come to an understanding of their own place in the world. In this general technological myth, the figure of the human gets replaced by a robot, while nature, nature itself, gets substituted by a machine. The Canadian artist Norman White has created quite a different artistic robot named Helpless Robot. The upright standing box with handles and a pedestal above which the upper part of the sculpture can be rotated doesn't resemble an anthropomorphic robot. The base contains a built-in loudspeaker through which a nagging, squawking voice requests the exhibition visitor to move the robot. When a visitor obeys, soon the voice complains about the direction in which it is being turned or about the speed being either too fast or too slow. The installation subverts the usual serving role of the robot and in inverts the relation of master and servant. This hierarchical relationship has already been constituted when the expression robot was first used by the Czech writer Karl Čapek at the beginning of the 1920s. In the stage play Rossum's Universal Robots, RUR, these robots are anthropomorphic, artificial work slaves who in Čapek's story rise up against their human masters. The figure of the robot thus emerged from the context of automated industrial production and is to be understood very much in accordance with the Taylorist optimization of work and as a derivation of the laboring human body. The British artist Keith Piper, for his interactive installation Robot Bodies, has further accentuated this constellation by highlighting the parallels between the figure of the robot and the figure of the black slave. Both robot and slave are, I quote Piper, visibly other and as such are assigned particular roles within the cultural and economic order. Both are imagined within particular discourses to act according to type. Both can be assigned grueling tasks in hostile and alien environments. Both are perceived as possessing a physical configuration which positions them as either compliant servant or non-compliant monster. Piper has identified several passages in Chapek's play that support this comparison of robot and black slave, both the subjects of originary dehumanization. I quote, and this is now Piper quoting from the Chapek play, practically speaking, what is the best kind of worker? It's the one that is the cheapest the one with the fewest needs. When engineering the RUR robots, young Rossum chucked out everything not directly related to work, and in doing that, he virtually rejected the human being and created the robot. Elsewhere in the play, the relation between the robot narrative and the exploitation of black African slaves in the colonies is made even more explicit. I quote, but in the meantime, we've dumped 500,000 tropical robots down on the Argentine pampas to grow corn. 
Would you mind telling me how much you pay for a pound of bread? The dehumanization and subjection of the laboring human body is an integral element of the myth of the robot, which I would claim cannot be called upon without also calling upon this symbolical resonance. In the title of my talk today, Robots versus Machines, the versus is more a rhetorical gesture than a claim to a structural aspect of the discourse on techniques. I chose for this antagonistic phrase in order to pinpoint the confrontation of these two quite different paradigms of the relationship that humans and techniques have. Robots and machines represent different imaginary models for the relationship between humans and techniques based on, and this I think is crucial, different models of the human. While the technical entity of the robot positions the human as a replaceable worker, as slave and also as colleague who can be the subject of empathy and solidarity, the technical entity of the machine positions the human as a non-technical other, as both free from and excluded from the technical process, implying the irrelevance and obsolescence of the human in a potential techno-scientific future. To reiterate, my purpose here is not to actively encase these concepts in a specific limited understanding. Rather, the purpose is to point out that the metaphors of the machine and the robot are part of a specific mythology and that in order to change the relation between humans and techniques, it is necessary to tell a different set of stories and to do that in a different language. One area where such new narratives and languages are explored is the field of artistic practice, where artworks and projects constitute ways to reflect on such technocultural relationships, to pinpoint their inherent contradictions, and to rethink technology by way of what Bertolt Brecht, with regard to the techniques of theater, called umfunktionieren, repurposing. As a conclusion to this talk, I would like to spend a few more minutes to look at some artworks with you, which I would like to introduce as potential reference examples for our conversations here in the next two days. In the late 1950s, the Swiss artist Jean Tangeli created a whole series of sculptures, which he called metamatics and which each with a different mechanism, delegated the work of making a drawing to a bric-a-brac apparatus, which the exhibition visitor could trigger, but not control. The resulting drawings are determined by the mechanical structure of the sculpture, whose functioning is automatic in a somewhat chaotic way. Compare this to the installation by Patrick Tressy, six robot named Paul. It encompasses a number of robotic arms equipped with small cameras and controlled by a computer system, which like in a drawing class at art school, each draw a portrait of a visitor who takes the role of a sitter. The drawing process is also automatic, like in the Tangeli, yet unlike the exuberant vivacity of Tangeli's metamatics, we here see a controlled process that is programmed to lead to lifelike representations. We could almost call it a form of photography. Then I would like to draw your attention to another work by David Rokeby called The Giver of Names. 
and a predecessor project to the installation Enchan that we looked at earlier. The interactive setup of the giver of names installation invites the visitor to place one or more objects in front of a camera upon which the computer system attempts by means of pattern recognition to identify the item and starts up a poetic stream of associations that it finds in, a data, in its database and connected to the recognized item. This project is a reminder that the questions haunting current debates about artificial intelligence have been around for decades and return to the same dichotomies of representation and emergence, simulation and autonomy. I try to discuss some of the issues with regard to the giver of names in the book on machine art and maybe we will have time later to venture more deeply into the idiosyncratic mythology and aesthetics of this piece. Finally, I would like to end with a recent project by the British artist Anna Riddler, who, as in other projects, addresses issues that concern many of the practical applications of machine learning and enhanced pattern recognition systems, like the collection and classification of data, the bias inherent in data sets and information models, and the hidden human labor involved in such digital content production. For her project, Fall of the House of Usher, again, maybe some of you have looked at the video online in preparation. For this project, Riddler produced a number of watercolor drawings. You see some examples on the top left in the frames that formed the material basis for training a neural network that was in turn used to produce the film of the same title, some stills on the right. The result here is determined by the input data and the structures gleaned from them in the same way as all those GAN-based systems produce the visual output that we get to see in so many versions of AI art these days. However, Riddler works not with millions of data sets classified by thousands of anonymous click workers, but she does all of this work herself and exhibits the material basis of the data set alongside the resulting digital film. It is one of the originary paradoxes of Western culture that any artifice is understood as something that is made by humans and that is not itself human, but artificial. The logical foundation of that paradox might be that as a matter of principle, this belief system regards everything that is human made as non-human. It is a dialectics that has haunted techniques and art and the understanding of what it means to be human for a long time. And it also lies at the root of our struggle with the notion of creation or the faculty of creativity. Riddler's projects remind us that there are no boundaries, but only entanglements between the product, the labor, the technical assemblage that enable the making and the perceiving of the work. A constellation that would merely be obscured by a strong humanistic notion of either an author or a machine, but it appears difficult to let go of either of them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas, for this yes. uh, rich lecture. This was uh, very insightful. Um, before I ask my uh, first question, I would like to um, ask our um, uh, attendees 
to uh, post their questions in chat. You can also post in Q&A, but perhaps it's easier just to keep track of all the questions in chat. But please make sure uh, when you post your question to uh, in, in this um, uh, Dropbox to, to choose all panelists and attendees and not only panelists. So um, just to make sure that everyone can see your question. I would um, like to return to your notion of uh, language and how language um, serves or if we can say feeds the, the myth of the machine. We are um, experiencing different types of research that is devoted to uh, relationships between humans and machines and then we can say specifically robots and for the pragmatic reasons we very often encounter terms such as the robot greets, the robot works, the robot breathes, the, and so forth. If you push that narrative a little bit further, you can also encounter terms such as robot surgeon or robot writer and, and, and so forth. So all of a sudden you, you have um, some terms are used that could possibly mean a whole repository of meanings and now they are um, applied to a very kind of precise embodied technical system. Do you think that that contributes to the myth of the machine? And if it does, uh, in, in which way uh, such pragmatic challenge can be avoided? How, how can that be um, dealt with? Thank you for the question. Um... Uh, I think that what you describe is, it, it's what I call speaking in the myth. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, when you don't see the difference, if you don't follow my demystification exercise, um, if you think that a machine that you can call a technical device a machine, in innocently, then in my view, you're in that bubble. And so somebody who calls a, a technical device a surgeon is in that bubble of anthropomorphization, um, which doesn't, you know, from a pragmatic point of view, it may not even be a problem because, um, you know, a lot of the time people just want to get their job done. But in order to clarify this relationship that uh, we have with technology and what technology means in our culture, I think it is necessary to take that step back and to develop a more critical idea of the language that we use. And, you know, as I say, personally, I try to forbid myself those uh, metaphors and it's an interesting for me personally it's an interesting exercise to try and avoid them in the way in which I speak about technical systems um, and I would invite everybody to at least put the quotation marks that's already you're, you're already doing a lot when you put quotation marks mm -hmm. because you create that little distance um, and our language works in a way that all the terms can be replaced by making a little detour, by inventing a new word, um, by um, explaining things in other words. And personally, I think that when we're thinking about uh, technology, our contemporary understanding of technology, terms like machine and robot are holding us back in a paradigm of the 19th and 20th centuries when the technological system, and this is the crucial point for me, the technological systems have advanced into a much more ecological uh, paradigm 
where a term like the machine is not able to capture the complicated relationship that we have with those systems and that also become uh, socially efficacious. So what technical systems are doing to our society at the moment is complex to an extent that if you use an anthropomorphic language of the 19th century, you're not able to capture the complexity, maybe also the potentials of those technical systems. And for that reason, I'm saying, let go of those old terms of the 19th century and let's try and find new terms to describe the technicity of our existence. Um, as I said in my talk, it's uncomfortable because we have to learn new words. We have to you know, watch our language. But in other areas, we do that all the time today. You know, we've become very gender uh, conscious in our language and we've become conscious about um, different uh, subject positions that people have. Um, I think we should also become subject conscious in relation to technology. Thank you very much. Here we have the first question um, from Savino Rua, who asks, thank you for the talk. Would a symbolic system such as law or the state qualify as a machine in your understanding? I don't qualify anything as a machine. I look, I'm a, in what I'm doing, I'm, it's, uh, it's um, discourse analysis. I look at what other people are saying. So um, the state, the law, all of those have been called machines. Um, you know, think, for instance, of Lewis Mumford's important study of the myth of the machine, which he wrote in the 1960s. There, he talks about the mega machine, and the mega machine is this whole set of institutions that intersect with uh, industrial, economic, uh, technological systems. So for him, the mega machine is this total modern state in a way. Um, so I can only, to that question, I can only say, uh, yes, people have called these systems uh, machines. And with my understanding of the myth of the machine, I can ask back, what do you think, how does the conception of that system of law change when you call it a machine, when you call it something that is separate from you, that has its own logic, and that can take on uh, potentially an autonomy that becomes threatening to humans. Mm -hmm. I would say that's what happens when somebody calls law a machine. I find that worrying and I think it's inappropriate to law in a democratic state because law in my understanding, uh, maybe a little bit romantic, is a way for groups of people to regulate the way in which they live together. To mm -hmm. call that a machine and to externalize that in such a way is uh, actually quite counterproductive to developing uh, a democratic and um, participative understanding of living together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a question from uh, Joanna. She says, thank you for the great talk. Do you think it's possible to escape the metaphoricity of language altogether? What is your model of a good and proper language in which we should A, philosophize and B, speak about art. It relates to the, yeah, to the yeah. question. Of course. Yeah. Um, th there's no way to get away from those metaphors. So there is no clean or whatever mm -hmm. uh, language uh, because I think that the only way in which we can understand words 
and the way in which language operates is by making those associations, mm -hmm. um, which I think um, distinguishes us from the machine learning systems. Mm -hmm. um, the classification that we use for understanding something uh, is always dirty. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but what I'm advocating is to make ourselves aware of those associations, of those connotations, and to be aware of the, the baggage that we bring into the conversation and into our own thinking by using certain words. And some of those metaphors, you know, all of Donna Haraway's narrative work is a good example for that. Some of those metaphors we may deliberately choose. There are situations where I like to use the word machine because I mean it in the sense of the myth of the machine. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm sure that there are many words that I use innocently and I should look at them much more critically. And this is really just an invitation to, to be self-critical in our use of language. Thank you. Uh, we have a question uh, from Galit Velna. Thank you for the great talk. Your definition of machine resembles that of Heidegger to technology that is not a technical concept, but rather a way of human revealing. Will it be possible to make a similar argument um, algorithms? Or for algorithms, there is a little hmm. word missing. I guess that one could do a similar analysis of the way in which the notion of the algorithm or the term algorithm is used mm -hmm. um, and how at the, you know, I, I try to say what a rigorous understanding of algorithm might be. Um, of course, people use it in all sorts of ways. And if somebody went to look at those usages in a critical way, um, so I guess that a similar argument could be made. And it would probably be interesting to see how the, the notion of the algorithm then relates to the notion of the machine, this uh, agency of the term machine that I'm describing, and how it relates to a term like robot, system, mathematics, and so on. So somebody else, I think, will have to make that exercise in relation to the algorithm, to the word algorithm. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm sure it would also be very interesting. I introduced it here because I think it's a very important term in our conversations over the next two days. And it's also one of those words we should be a little bit nervous about. Thank you. And this will be our final question for this session uh, by uh, Jan Lerman Stevenson. Uh, thank you for a great talk, Andreas. Would you uh, also apply those question marks for so-called Joanna uh, Zulinska, uh, that, that she argues elsewhere, to our different notions of creativity as well, or creativities, under inverted commas? I don't understand the question. Shall I read it again? Uh, would you also apply these quotation marks or so-called, um, as jo Joanna, as Joanna argues elsewhere, to our different notions of creativity as well? Then he adds cre creativities. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, th I mean, creativity for me is, is a super vague word. Mm -hmm. My own intuition my own association with that word is related to the Christian Bible. Mm -hmm. So creation is bringing something into the world that wasn't there before. It's God saying, let there be light and then the light comes on. Um, and so creativity is the presumption that you can somehow bring something into the world that wasn't there before. Um, 
if you need that, if you need to make that gesture in what you say, you know, it's it probably it's possible to uh, to say that this is what you're doing when you're being creative. Um, personally, I think that many of the uh, processes that we are thinking of in relation to creativity today, uh, we don't really need that word, not in the understanding that I have of it. And, um, but, you know, other people have a much more humble, maybe less ambitious um, understanding of that term. And then they, if they feel comfortable with that word, they should be but personally i think it's another one of those traps because it again it pretends that there is a structural similarity between god the human and a gan for instance and for me that doesn't make sense i'm uh, grateful for that uh, clarification also when we were about to um launched this conference, we thought a lot about the, the title and we realized that creativity is such a charged term that can be observed from so many um, different perspectives that we would actually get uh, all those contributions from uh, uh, various researchers and uh, we, the organizers, when we actually had a chance to, to see all videos, we felt wiser. Um, and um, But I completely agree with you that um, Creativity is a multifaceted term that has to be contextualized.